All right, guys. Here we go. I feel like I just turned into a... Here we go, yo. Here we go, yo. You know that song, right? No? Just me? Okay. Is everyone settling in? Get a comfy pillow? Get a get a smoothie or something? Have a seat and settle in because we got a cool one for you today. I'm excited. I'm excited about today's guest. I'm excited about today's stream. I tell you, when you see her setup, I think we're all going to be excited because we all, you know, we're all suckers for. Her. I mean, if you're a Reason user, you're you're kind of at your heart. You're also a hardware, you know, lover, even in the virtual form. And we got, we're bringing both. We're bringing both to you today. Guys, welcome to the stream. It's the Reason live stream. It is December 8th. I'm both excited and not excited to say that tomorrow is my birthday. Um, so I'll be turning 20. We'll just say that. That'll be that'll be my lie. Um, but um, yeah, I although I have I, I'm I'm submitting it to all of you, and and we can all agree on this. Maybe we can get behind this. I think we aren't. We shouldn't count birthdays in 2020. Let's just like it's a mulligan. We just we'll pick it up again in 2021. But let's not. We've had so much to deal with in 2020. We don't need to count the the march of time, the unforgiving march of time as well to the, the list of 2020 things. So let's not do that. But how are you guys doing? Let me know in the chat. What have you been up to? How you been this last week? Last week, am I? Yeah, last week was when we listened to all those Reason 1 song challenges. Man, were those fun. I, I listened through, there's a couple of them. I went back and listened through again just for the, for the they were just good tunes. I just liked them. I, like, oh, I want to find that one again. Um, you guys all did so great. Someone is saying, let's ask Ryan. Um, Chalice, let's ask me what? I don't... Uh, don't know. Oh, it looks gray and black. Oh boy. Re remind me in the comment what it is that we're, um, oh, are, you're asking, is you're talking about my shirt? You're having a, a dress, that blue, gray, gold, white, gold situation with my shirt. It's gray and black. If that's what you're talking about, guys. Yeah. Um, this is not, first of all, bringing up my flannels. Guys, I, first of all, I was just telling Biyun that uh, before we got on, I was telling her that you guys are weirdly obsessed about my wardrobe, but uh, here it is. She's she's seeing it firsthand. This is not even a flannel. This is a just a cotton shirt. I can if I get it real close, we can count the regular old thread count. All right, so I don't even want to hear it. I swear. For you know what? For my birthday, if you guys want to get me something, get me non flannels, and then you can all uh, move on from it. Uh, okay, yeah, it's uh, it's it's gray and black. It's a, uh, it's a Calvin Klein. You can all, uh, well, although it's uh, it's old, so I don't know if you can get it still. But anyway, um, no, it's not brown. Man, this, maybe we'll just spend the whole, we can spend the whole stream here debating the, whether my shirt is brown or gray, though anyone who says it's brown is insane. So um, <clears throat> I might, uh, might ban you. Stefan, if anyone says the shirt's brown, just ban them from the, the stream altogether, from our channel obliterate their reason license like i don't i want nothing to do with them all right guys listen um how i hope everyone's been good i hope you've been making music and not just working on your color blindness uh this past week i have been making a little bit of music I've actually been working on the old uh, banjo back there writing a new instrumental tune on that that i'll be recording in the next couple of weeks i'm kind of putting the finishing touches on the arrangement and then you know what else i did this week is i started watching a show that's like it's kind of a dumb show, but it's also kind of interesting, so I'm I'm conflicted on it. I'm definitely not making a recommendation, but I will share it in case anyone is vaguely interested in this. Um, it's a show that's on Hulu right now. It was on NBC in the U.S., and it's one of these, like, X Factor and The Voice and American Idol, one of these kind of shows, which, like, eh, not my thing. This one's called Songland, and what it's about, though, the way that this one's structured is that they... They don't, it's not people hoping to be the next star. It's songwriters that have written songs that go in front of one of those classic panel show type things and they pitch their songs to an artist and then the artist ends up picking a couple of the songs to develop and then one of the songs becomes something they actually take on in, as a 
cut on their album or whatever. And in that regard, it is fascinating. So like as much as I hate the format and the kind of the more of the whole reality TV thing, it is fascinating to watch someone come in with an idea that they, it, it must be their best song. They're like, okay, it's my elevator pitch moment. I only get one chance to pitch us a, a country song to Lady A and I'm a, a wannabe or an aspiring Nashville songwriter. This is my shot. I'm taking it with the song. So in their minds, that's a fully formed, ready to go song. And then the, this panel of people, they start kind of developing it and picking it apart and going, well, this part could use work or you don't have a chorus yet, you know, or we should change this whole lyric or let's change what the whole song's about, you know, and they work it up. And it was actually really fascinating to watch, like from a, a kill your darlings perspective, you know, we get so attached to the things that we work on that watching someone bring something that must be in their minds be feel like as perfect as they can get it watching them make that square one and then build from there was actually really interesting so anyway if anybody can like me kind of look past the 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 cliches of uh reality tv it's kind of an interesting watch if you've got hulu so uh anyway look that's not oh hulu who says you honey that's it's like our oh that's not it wait uh there you go um it's uh, one of it's like netflix i guess you don't have it in sweden maybe but anyway, okay, guys, uh, that's all that. It looks like everybody's made it in here. So let's get down to brass tacks here. Let's bring in our guest. Um, we got a lot to chat with her about, a lot to show you. We're going to be doing some cool stuff, I think. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, Beyoon, to the stream. I'm going to just bring her on here. Hang on a second. Beyoon, you have made it. You have arrived on the internet. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Now, I have to... Also Oh, go ahead. Happy almost birthday. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I, I will take, I'll take the birthday wishes. Can I, can I get the birthday wishes without the, the having to update the year one, one number up? Cause I, the, yeah. the, the birthday wishes part I like, that's all nice. So maybe you can just go negative, like start counting the other. Days. Yes. That's, that's if. 2020 was the year that the whole playbook got thrown out. So why? Well, let's all start Benjamin buttoning. We'll just start going backwards. I'm totally for that. I'm I'm for that for a while. There would come a point where I'm like, oh no, I don't I don't really want to be 14 again. That wasn't super fun. But uh, but I I could enjoy a few of those years. Um, but yeah, now listen, I gotta I gotta tell you, everybody uh, looking at the uh, looking at your your feed here is gonna start they're probably not even listening to me talking but they're just kind of like looking around and, and taking stock of things i'm eyeballing the vinyl you've got back there it looks like you got an sp uh not an sp uh, uh, techniques 1200 you've got gear out the wazoo and and you've fortunately for us because we're all gear lovers you've set us up with a camera view that we can actually see that stuff so um uh maybe uh could we would you mind giving us a little tour of this very awesome workspace you've got going on yeah, so in view, um, I've got my RE-303 right here, which is kind of my central instrument. Uh, it's a um, replica, not a clone, of the original 303, so it sounds just like it. What, well, so better... What's the distinction between a replica and a clone? Um, I mean, the, the circuitry and the components are pretty much identical to... Uh, the original 303 with gotcha. this one, whereas a clone is kind of like a reworked thing. I see. I see. Some things are not quite identical. Um, the the only difference with this is it has a, I think, better. It's better than the original because it has an improved uh, sequencer on it, improved CPU on board. So oh. you can do some nice things with it. Um, We'll, oh, yeah. we'll talk about the 303 probably in more depth um, because it's it's got some quirks and some fun stuff to it. But um, cool. And then uh, that's a 909 above it, right? Yeah, this is the um, TR09. So it's uh, Roland's like boutique uh, instrument. Um, so it's like a newer version. This is the Electron Rhythm right here. This is kind of my main drum machine. Um, you can play samples as well as... Uh, on board, there's there's an analog drum machine uh, sounds that you can kind of tweak. And over here, um, this is another really crucial piece. This is the SH01A. I use this. Slide my um, camera out of view here so people can see it. Um, yeah. It's okay. It's, it's just me. I was covering it. 
Yeah. Um, so this this one um, I kind of use more for maybe more electro tracks or techno tracks, um, but it's got a kind of similar character to the 303's acid sound. But this is really the acid box right here. And off screen, I have some other things. But um, and uh, this is MIDI keyboard. Um, here in the center, I have a, um, X a Behringer X Touch One. It's just a little control surface that has a nice like SSL like um, uh, slider here so I can control the volume of like the master or individual channels by going through each of the little little buttons so I can direct uh, what it's doing on kind of on screen um, with reason and I just have like a little MIDI controller here set up where I put some shortcuts to mutes to specific channels oh so I can quickly silence something because I've got several uh, things set up for that is a handy. I hadn't, I, I've done. I haven't done that. Weirdly enough, I haven't done that on music stuff. But I do that on video stuff. I, and I don't have it now. But when I used to do live streams a few years ago, I would have one of those. I, I think it was the Korg Nano, something pad, whatever it's called. Um, and I was doing that. I was assigning MIDI values to like switch cameras and and turn on and off overlays and stuff like that. And for whatever reason, my the video part of my brain didn't talk to the music part of my brain and go, Hey, this would be useful. Like instantly I'm thinking about things like, you know, turning on, a, like bypassing the mastering chain on and off just to be able to sort of check it on a mastered output, but mix into a non mastered output or, you know, kill all solos. That's one that I have to go scrolling for all the time when I need to just like, I solo something and then I'm working and then I just want to quickly kill seven different solo channels. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. That's a good. And I, now I imagine you are, I mean, I don't think I'm, I'm speaking out of turn here and saying you're kind of a hardware person. You like the hardware, um, but, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you have kind of built, um, you've brought the software out of the, out of the screen into hardware so that you can actually interact with it in that way too. That's kind of an interesting solution to rather than rather than forcing yourself to conform in a way to the flat two-dimensional software, you've, you've 3D'd it, you know? Yeah. I mean, for some things, hardware is, you know, like for the 303, for instance, it's sequencer and kind of the quirks behind it and also just all the controls and the sound of it. It's hard, it's hard to kind of replicate that same feel in software. Um, but I mean, for all the things I do use the software for, like effects, arrangement, um, and just keeping track of various projects. Um, if I want to work on multiple projects at a time, like you can't really do that with a full hardware setup and software just gives you so much more flexibility. Um, and also the thing I love about Reason is it looks like hardware. So it feels like very natural to go between the two worlds. Right. Um, yeah. So. Uh, and and everything just I don't know it it just makes it seem very like fluid going between the two worlds. So right now, you, I've talked with a lot of people in doing this live stream. I've talked with a lot of people um, that come into Reason. It, there's sort of different generations that have come into Reason. People that came into it back when it first came out, they were hardware people, and the the hardware metaphor that is the reason rack was something that just clicked for them because it was familiar from the hardware they knew. You are of an interesting generation because you're, you're not coming in from, you, you weren't, I'm, I'm assuming, unless, unless you are aging just fantastically, I'm assuming that you weren't <laughs> producing music in the early nineties, you know, on hardware. And yeah, no. <laughs> um, so you, you came into, you had the option to come into hardware and software at the same time, and yet the reason rack metaphor still resonated with you and clicked with you, which is, I think, an interesting, almost more interesting type of person. Um, and I, I'm sorry to the people out there. I'm counting myself among the the uh, the previous generation, but um, you know, I think it's I think it's interesting that 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 hardware rack concept still works. It's a timeless concept that still works and makes sense to your brain as someone who didn't even have the, the rooting in it from the actual hardware world. And now obviously you do cause you, you're surrounded by it. So, but yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's just, it feels more tangible. And I think at the end of the day, when I want to be creative, um, I need that sense of tangibility. I need 
you know, to, to see where all the sliders and the knobs are um, and just see what each thing does um, versus having it like hidden away behind tons of menus or yeah. uh, looking like an Excel spreadsheet, not going to name any uh, programs, <laughs> but. <laughs> you so, know, we, we, yeah. are, we are, uh, with the Reason Rack plugin, we, we are, are friends of every DAW out there. So um, we. Yes, <laughs> yes, we love all the DAWs. <laughs> but uh, that's not to say our users aren't uh, loyal and, and territorial about those things. And that's, that's fine too. But so I wanted to, um, kind of dig in a little bit before we dig into reason related things. I thought maybe we could dig in a little bit to sort of your music making journey. Um, because it's kind of an interesting one to me, I think a little bit about, well, well maybe, maybe you could share with, with the audience. Sort of what, what was your foray into maybe music making in general as a concept, but certainly the music that you make and your exposure to it and getting into making it? Yeah, so um, I mean, specifically house and techno and acid house, um, that really came when I kind of traveled uh, on my own to Berlin uh, one winter and kind of uh, went to a couple of the clubs there, Trezor and Berghain, and that was kind of the first time that I was really exposed to that kind of music. And this was all sparked from prior to that trip what actually instigated the whole trip of going to Germany. I was partially also visiting my, my grandmother, my Oma there, um, but I made like a, a weekend trip to Berlin on the side. Um, but that like earlier that year, I had gone to a drum and bass night, um, which is, you know, kind of, it's, it's definitely related. Um, <laughs> uh, I had gone to a drum and bass night in Boston and that was the first time I kind of noticed a DJ and it kind of, piqued my interest and I kind of felt like, oh, maybe clubs aren't all top 40 stuff. Like there might be something interesting going on here. And so that made me more interested to go to the clubs in Berlin when I was there because, uh, you know, all my cousins were like, well, that, that's really what that city is about. So, um, right. Yeah. That's and, amazing. Uh, I mean, Tre Trezor is like huge. I mean, that's w like world class you know, club and, and, and certainly, you know, at the time that you would have been going there as well. I mean, it, it is such a, what an exposure to sort of be like, Hey, I should check this out. And then you go and check it out. There is like, <laughs> you know, I, when I lived in, I lived in Liverpool in the UK and I had a similar thing. I wasn't um, very exposed to, I mean, as a, you know, as a, a kid growing up in the States before EDM was kind of a ascending you know, commercially viable thing. It was more of a niche thing. I wasn't exposed much to it. And um, then I went over to Liverpool and they had a club there called Nation, uh, which had a, a sort of famous monthly event called Cream, which became this like massive thing. And I just sort of end up landing just in the neighborhood where it was like the premier club for what at the time was sort of the big trance movement that was going on. And it was, yeah, it was a similar thing. I can, I can relate to that, that you're, you're getting to, uh, explore something by seeing the best of the best of it first, yeah, you know, first, it kind of ruined the experience. Everywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> you did get to appreciate, um, I actually, after that and going back and forth, I started to appreciate the smaller parties a lot more. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Now there, there's um, a guy in the chat. Captain NRG says, I used to DJ in Boston. Captain, maybe you were DJing at a drum and bass night when Biyun saw you, it's possible. There's a, there's some statistical calculation that that could be the case. Probably not, but. Um, summer, summer, summer of 2012, basically around that time. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Was it in 2012 cap? Because if it was, then, uh, <laughs> then our, our odds just went up. Um, but so you were, so you're, that was your exposure in, in Germany. That was your exposure to sort of techno and house and sort of those. Um, I, I mean, drum and bass is, it's a very different style than those. I mean, yeah. those, the techno and house is sort of very rooted in kind of the traditional, I guess, ingredients of if we, if we use EDM as a blanket term, it's kind of the, the kind of the traditional foundations of, it's like bebop jazz versus fusion modern jazz. You know, it's like the, the, the traditional stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, but I mean, there's now some, some crossover. Yes. Happening right. Too, right. So. 
a little bit of a jungle revival as well. Oh, right, right. <laughs> so, what and, was it yeah. about about the that experience that sort of drew you to not just um, enjoying that music? I mean, there's a lot of people that could go to a club and be like, oh, I got to like, I got to get some, I get these tracks on Beatport and listen to them and I'm going to buy these albums. But but you went one step further into the, I want to be making this. That's a That's a bigger leap. What was it for you that actually kind of got you in that direction? I mean, I... I had always been like, uh, I guess, into music or doing something musical my whole life and, and, you know, a past life in grade school, I used to play oboe in the band and orchestra. Um, and so uh, I, to me, I've all I always wanted with that instrument to do something other than just play other people's music, but I kind of dropped it eventually because I found it kind of boring to play other people's music, but then I saw, you know, when I heard this, uh, you know, house and techno for the first time um, in the club, I, it it kind of made me realize, like, you know, maybe this is something that I should do because it, it pulled it. It was just kind of this calling, like I don't like. <laughs> it's I it's it it you can't describe it, but you just know you know when you hear it and you're like, I need to do this. Right. And, and, and it's like, oh, I, my first thought was, where can I find more of this? Like once I go home and how, how can I make it? And I, I don't think I've ever had that thought of like immediately, how can I make it? But this is what happened when, when I heard the music and I was like, you know, it, I think it just, in my mind to make music, in the past is like, oh, you need a big studio. Um, you need a lot of really fancy recording equipment. You need to have the right space, right acoustics. Uh, you need to have a lot of, um, play, you know, in instrument players um, to be involved. And I was still kind of thinking in the old school way. Um, and it just felt like not really tangible because um, I, I, I was coming from being a science geek. So that was kind of my focus before that. I was studying right. physics. So, um, to me, I was, I was kind of removed from, from, you know, kind of the more recent developments in music, which was happening for quite a long time, <laughs> um, but I was just never exposed to it. Right. And, um, and so that was the first time where I was like, oh, wow, this is actually more tangible than I thought it would be. And that must be and, a really empowering yeah. experience then to actually think about it that way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny I, to think I, about I, your, your oboe. <laughs> it's like an oboe player. I'm imagining <laughs> oboe players, an oboe player playing alone in a room is a very sad, lonely image. You know, uh, an, an electro producer in a room making music is very cool. Sort of a very, very viable sort of thing. Um, but also even coming from your science background, I could imagine science is a very, I mean, it, I, I'm, I'm sure there's, there's stuff that is, sort of solo work and stuff, but science at, at its core is a very collaborative, like it takes a lot of people to actually do science to its fullest yes. extent, right? You can't, yeah. you can't say like, I'm going to single-handedly, I mean, just the, the concept of a peer reviewed study is impossible without a peer, right? Right. There's like at least 10 authors on. Yeah. Page. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I could imagine, yeah, coming, coming at this and sort of seeing it as, as something that you could, that you want to do, you know, and, and you have that sort of, there's that inner calling. I mean, there's no way to say it without it sounding kind of woo woo, but it is what we all go through that you, you've had that moment where you're like, I must do this, you know? Um, so having that experience and then realizing that it's possible to do on your own. And I, I, yeah, I can only imagine that being a kind of, you know, exciting rather than daunting feeling in a way. Yeah. Right. right? Yeah. Well, so what was your, um, what was that first step into, I got to do this? Well, when I got um, when I got back to Boston, uh, I started looking for you know either nights I could go to, um, to to hear the music more and and just like a, a some sort of school that could help me because um, I had no idea where to start and you know I I didn't even know what to search for um, like I didn't even know what DAW was or anything like that so um, I <laughs> lucky for me so the place where I was working at literally right across the street within eyesight was a school called Maven 
huh. uh, which was uh, um, they, they no, no longer exist now, unfortunately, but um, they, they were a school in Boston for a few years that had um, Ableton classes. So I actually learned first on Ableton um, and uh, also DJing classes. Um, and that, when I went over there, I went to the open house and I was like, yeah, I'm really interested in learning to produce um djing some some what didn't really interest me at the time as mm. much as like actually making the music um and then when i went through a production course i realized uh <laughs> what i was making wasn't really <laughs> what i wanted oh. so that's when i realized like i need to listen to a lot more music and really kind of build up that ear right um because you actually learn a lot more from hearing Rather than, I mean, you can learn all the technicalities and watch tutorial videos all day, but the most uh, important thing for you to do is listen to what you actually enjoy, right? Because that's what you'll want to make. Um, and so, I uh, I decided to, to take their DJ class, um, and uh, then that really sparked kind of that interest in DJing. Interesting, um, and it kind of went to a point where at some point I decided, wow, I need to create my own night. Cause I was like reading a bunch of books. I read last night, a DJ saved my life, uh -huh. that book. And, um, I was like, Oh, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe I should create a night. And then, so one thing led to another. And then I started my own night, um, with Bob Diesel, um, who's a, um, local legend in Boston. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it is a techno night, um, techno and some house night on um, on a Tuesday at Middlesex Lounge. And so that's where I kind of got my first DJ. Wow. Uh, that's like a, visiting. it's a modified version of that, um, uh, the, the Gandhi quote that people love to put on posters and mugs now that it's like, be the rave you want to see in the world. You know, you sort of made your own, made your own event, made your own night. That's really yeah. cool. And, and I, and that, that actually became quite a uh, an event if i'm if i'm remembering correctly we talked about this a couple of years ago but that that was quite a a happening as it were in boston right yeah yeah it turned into it tur it really turned into something and and you know just even a, a year's time um what you know the the first time i actually met pierre um who is the the creator of Asa house um if the one on the on the screen right knows. dj pierre uh, of of uh future and uh yeah out of, out of yeah. chicago right yeah out of chicago um we actually uh invited him to play for our anniversary and it it was on a tuesday and he was you know he came there he told me he was like oh, i was coming there i wasn't expecting much because it was on a tuesday in boston it was packed <laughs> <laughs> it was packed <laughs> like over capacity in the club. It was nuts. We had balloons everywhere. We made him a three of, it was also the epic part of it. It was, it was his birthday. Oh, um, yeah, that, that his birthday coincided with our Tuesday night and our anniversary, I guess it was, you know, in the stars or something. <laughs> um, and we made him a three Oh three cake, uh, which I'm not good at making cakes. So it turned out all right, but I would, I recommended that we didn't eat it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so, I thought you meant like it was, looked like a three oh three, but well, that's actually that's what I thought you were getting at. The the harder part would be all the like icing and what's it called fondant and stuff that you have to sort of like make that, you know. Yeah, it was like a melted three oh three. Okay. The, well, that's now, probably. But it had the general. Shape there's probably a fair number of three oh threes that are in that condition to this day, so uh, that's probably pretty accurate. <laughs> But so we should yeah. uh, should talk a little bit about the 303, I guess, because that is as you got into production and stuff, you that is still like you when you point it to your uh, your replica there. Um, that is still the heart of of so much of what you do is is 303 pattern programming. And I wonder for people that aren't acid house producers, what is it about that that has created 40 years worth of interest for producers and music listeners alike i mean it's just a it's such a trippy sound um like i'll just play a pattern <laughs>
even with a simple pattern, you can just twist the knobs in such a way to create like almost a a melody in itself within the pattern. Yeah. Just by how you uh, you develop the sound, um, and it it really makes it such a fluid instrument. I just um, I, hearing you do that. I mean, when it's funny, I when I mess with a three or three, it's, it's, it's just, I don't know. I always, my experience is always like, Oh, it's not as cool as when I hear other people do it. And it just happened again because like, yeah, I know you weren't really putting your heart and soul into the, that uh, performance as it were, but still it was like, you did the right moves at the right time to kind of make it sound cool. And it gave me an epiphany. I just had this major epiphany as to why the 303 works the way it does. And maybe I'm late to the game. Maybe you're going to be like, yeah, yeah, no, everybody knows that you idiot. But the filters in the 303, with the resonance turned up, when you sweep the filter, you're actually moving through the harmonic series of the overtones of the sound. So even though the melody isn't changing, you're actually re-melodizing the pitches in a but through a filter. I don't know. My brain's kind of breaking with it. I'm I'm freaking out, man. That's so I never really thought of it until I heard you do it. And all of a sudden, it sounded like an like how can one melody be sustainable for for that's seven minutes and it's like oh because it's almost virtually multiple melodies when you move that yes. i don't know yeah exactly and especially when you add defects effects like a delay on it you just have like this kind of spacey feeling. right right so, but yeah. so that is your but that is the world you live in you live in the world of patterns um and kind of coming up with patterns and i know the 303 has a kind of quirky way that it actually programs patterns but that's almost part of its charm right Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is almost part. Yeah, it, I mean, it's at first it's pretty intimidating, um, but once you get the hang of it, you're like, okay, entering the number of steps and what timing I want, and then you kind of play with the the pitches, and um, you can get some interesting results uh, through that kind of very, in a way, forced uh, way of thinking about patterns, um, and you know, once you get used to it, you just you you get pretty good at figuring out what to do with it. Um, it's, it's maybe, it, may, it might be one of the most classic examples that people like to, to often say things like, oh, limit, limitations can be creatively inspiring. And I often think of, of things like the 303 in that regard, where it's like, that whole box is about limitations, you know? And, yeah. and from that, all this music has happened, you know? You can't, yeah. I mean, am I correct in saying you can't go even on that updated unit, you can't go higher than 16 steps, right? Uh, yeah, no, you can only do 16, but you can string patterns together and stuff and make a track that way. Oh, okay. So you can have patterns playing back to back. There's a whole track feature. And if you listen to acid tracks, uh, which is the, the first acid track that came out, um, that was actually created using track mode. So that was a bunch of patterns. Oh, really? Strung together. Yeah. So, so yeah, you can, I mean, you can also cue up the patterns individually as it's playing right um, and just change it up but yeah that, so how is it listening so when you you're talking about just for people following along the the first the song that is credited as being kind of the first acid track was called acid tracks and i guess that's where the name obviously comes from um when you listen to that today does it is it like watching a black and white movie where you go oh that's cute or is it still a completely valid part of the of the genre and stands up today you know i think it's still a totally valid um piece of of, of you know the the acid house work um it, it's you know not a lot of people really play um the 303 in the way pierre does um because he's constantly twisting the knobs and really putting his soul into kind of getting that sound out. Um, and I think even today, you know, a lot of people will let it run and kind of twist it here and there. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> That's but me. they're not really, <laughs> <laughs> but, they're, but they're not really kind of feeling what to do with, with it. I mean, it's just kind of, a, uh, I, I, I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, not everyone is, it, there's definitely a lot of producers who are, who are like that. And as you, become more familiar with the instrument, you develop your own feeling for it in that, that way that, it, that you develop your own expressiveness with it. 
um just like if you give two different guitar players a different guitar they'll come up with something different just based on their their technique and and everything so. right right would you say um you know the in the the era of everyone talking about the 10,000 hour rule have you kind of put in your 10,000 hours with that box is it is it you there's been uh, maybe not 10,000 but you've probably put in a good deal of time i've i've definitely put in a good deal of time uh Maybe not so much with this specific box, but I have over here, kind of out of the, the frame. This is the TB03. Oh, um, okay. That's the reissue, the Roland reissue? The, re, the reissue one. And I love this one because you can run it on batteries. And what I did for the longest time is I would just take it with me everywhere. Like I, I know when I visit my parents, I took it with me to the beach and would just like make some acid on the beach. Wow. And, careful not to get any sand in it <laughs> and and um like take it to the park um uh on on flights uh on trains um and just have my my headphones in it and just kind of listen to how i could create that kind of expressiveness with each of the knobs and what it kind of did and over time it just takes practice like with any instrument yeah yeah you develop this kind of sixth sense of what you need to do uh to to get it to be expressive so. right a, a comment came in from uh, melody klein she says the abl3 is is her, uh, her favorite looks like her favorite software 303 have you messed around with that uh either as a rack extension i think they make a plugin as well yeah no i haven't um i've i've kind of been in the the hardware uh realm with it um since sure. i started really playing with it when you've got the um, when you've got the hardware i imagine it's it's almost redundant to be, it, especially when you're so used to working tactily on it. You know. Yes, the, the having the knobs is so so uh, vitally important. And actually, on my TB03, I don't know if you can see, but I've replaced some of the knobs oh, yeah, there yeah. that I use the most, so they're a little more, uh, a little friendlier to the touch. Oh, and, just literally, yeah, just for the actual sort of ergonomics of how they feel. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Because the because the little little knobs that are on the TBO three really hurt your fingers after a while when you right. play around <laughs> right. a lot. So there is um, um there is something that you know software we are we are still beholden to the fact that we have one mouse that clicks one spot at a time and so just even when you were just talking about it, you you reached just naturally with both your hands and were gesturing as and it is it's a two handed operation most times right you're often on what is it? Is it cut off and resonance? That's kind of your main. Yeah, cut off resonance and envelope modulation. So those those two things, those three things are, are really what I'm playing with. And then every now and then I'll tweak the accent um, and decay a little bit. Gotcha. But yeah, these three, these three right here. Those are the that the, the money you knobs. If you're gonna if you're gonna map your your software synth to any any MIDI controller, you want it on those three. Gotcha. Uh, <laughs> right. That is, oh, that, that, that's actually a good point that, that I'm talking about the limitations of the mouse, but yeah, if anybody has a MIDI controller, that's the, that's the perfect solution. Just assign a couple knobs to those things. And then you can go back to, to actually getting more than one hand on your knobs at, the, at a time. So that's great. Someone, um, Ivan Velez, uh, asked just, I, and I forget it now, which version of the, the 303 is it? the black 303? It's a, yeah, the what? RE three hundred three. RE three hundred three. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's made by Dinsync. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, you, it's kind of a kit that you get, and you solder it. And did you solder it, it together? I did not. Oh, okay. um, I had a, a friend of mine, um, uh, Andreas. Uh, he he did this, um, and uh, and kind of got it from. I've him. been I've been yeah. trying to I've been during when the the quarantines and lockdowns first started back in March, I started doing a bunch of little soldering projects to kind of just, you know, as an activity. And I quickly ran out of things to solder. And so I've been trying to convince my friends, like I had a friend who wanted to get a mic preamp and I was like, Oh, order a kit and I'll solder it for you. And it's a hard sell. Nobody wants to, you know, hand it to me and just hope that I've returned it in working condition to them. So it's like, I need I need yeah. projects, people. Yeah, um, I, I tried soldering together a Zox box at one point. And, oh yeah, uh, that was sort uh, of the the first uh, kind of 
clone or I don't know. I don't know if it was how it, how yeah, close it's, it. it's, it's, it's a clone. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a replica, but, um, I think I just, you know, there's, there's, you can, you can do it. And certainly if you put the time in into it, you can do it, but you really need some diagnostic tools to figure out what's going on. Right. Right. Uh, like a, a oscilloscope and a function generator. And like that. <laughs> right, and right. I, I was like, I think I'm over my head on this. <laughs> it's had my a, verging <laughs> into your, verging into your science uh, background. It's like, no, I don't want to bring yeah. my science into my music. I want to keep those separate. But, I mean, I, I really wanted to do that, but and I was like, I don't know if it's like, I want to make tracks with it. I right. Mean, right. I like... uh, Ivan asked again, uh, if I could repeat who that's by, that's by DinSync, the R E three Oh three by DinSync and DinSync um, is D D I N Ivan, like a, like a DIN yeah. cable, DIN sync. Um, yeah. not to be confused with in sync. They in sync <laughs> made some of the worst three Oh three replicas of all time. So, uh, you definitely don't want to buy their three Oh threes. Um, yeah, cool. Well, um, so I, I guess we should, we should talk a little bit about kind of how this stuff integrates into reason. And we should also talk a little bit. I mean, part of, um, what I guess, you know, Stefan and I have been planning live streams and we've been excited to have you as a guest on anyway, but we happened to slot you into the calendar at a time when we had, would have released Pattern Mutator because it was one, you're, you're one of those artists where we just were like, oh, I bet you this is a, a Beyond kind of uh, device that we've got, you know, <laughs> and, and falls into your world a little bit. Um, so we should, we should maybe talk a little bit about that kind of stuff, but um before we even go into that, I mean, how, I wonder if you could show us a little bit about how you are merging your hardware and software world here that you, you've got, you run Reason standalone and yeah, you got, I, I'm, I'm seeing the MIDI out devices, I guess. Is that the hard, right. is that what's making it work? Yeah. So this is the ERM multi-clock and this is how I keep everything kind of lined up and in sync and um i have there's three different ports on it and each port has its own kind of delay shift so if uh you know i generally have like one one port going through like a three or so instruments but the um the re303 has its own because i really want to individually sometimes you want to play with that delay a little bit and have it lagging behind or having have it lagging oh, in front really and you want and there's a uh shuffle option on here to shuffle with it so this is just for the clock um if you're sending midi out through this it's not going to delay the the midi notes one way or another it's just going to be the timing of the clock and how i have this um set up with the clock is uh I have a click track, so I can show you here. Uh, there's a, a little VST that ERM gives you, and it oh, okay. gives you a little click track, and I have that um, routed to, uh, let's see if I, uh, <laughs> where is it? Yeah, so this is going out to, so here's the click oh, track right here. You're going out to a dedicated three and four yeah, output. This this output right here on my um, focus right is dedicated for the multi clock, and so this is the best way to kind of get that precise timing with the clock, because um, you're you reduce MIDI delay or USB delay, um, and the audio uh, click track is probably the the, the lowest latency you can get uh with with the clock interesting and, and the clock is i mean th this this whole setup lives and dies by the clock right if your your clock is off it yeah <laughs> it ain't no <okay. laughs> yeah if your clock is off um you know everything's going to be wildly out of sync and nothing's going to you're never going to have everything uh, exactly where you want it. And you won't be able to use both software instruments, which I, I use a lot. I use um, a lot of Arturia's uh, VSTs. They're, they're sweet. Um, Cause you know, I don't want to buy like my own CS80 cause that thing like will fall apart. Uh, right. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then, so if, if I have no way of keeping those two worlds in sync, uh, then it, it doesn't make any sense. Like you might as well just be all hardware or all software. So mm -hmm. that allows me to kind of be in, in 
in both to worlds. bridge that gap. I'm a little curious. You you mentioned something just it sounded interesting to me. You've got a live, so you've got a delay on that clock device that can push forward or backward on the beat. But you you said you had a shuffle. Do, do you literally mean that you if you if you're sending out straight sixteenth notes from in MIDI and it goes into that and you change the the shuffle, will they actually get like a swung sixteenth kind of vibe via the clock? It's no, it won't be the the MIDI. It'll be the clock timing. But the so the, the end result would would it sound the same? Yeah, it would sound a bit like a shuffle. Huh. But it would be the clock doing the the shuffle. Mm-hmm. It's a little little weird. So um, the the instrument would get kind of the clock not quite at the precise time, which yeah. would cause a shuffle in the MIDI output of, of the, the instrument. So, um, but that's more, you know, you see that effect more um, when you have an onboard sequencer on, on the machine. Like when I'm using the onboard sequencer for the 303 or the onboard sequencer for the SH-01A, um, you'll usually get that. And all the clock is doing is telling you when the on beat is for the most part or like when every beat is right um, okay yeah and so it's just kind of shifting the the beats here and there gotcha the gotcha interesting so so okay so so now i'm I'm just gonna uh stare at your reason rack here so you've got um you've got the that the clock is going to be a multi-clock and then everything else that we're looking at here is what go things that are going to hardware instruments yeah. Um, so let's see. Uh, I guess we'll start with the SH01A. Um, so because I'm running MIDI, so this is an interesting thing. Uh, the clock, you can control the delay with this knob, but if you're setting sending MIDI from Reason, it gets a little tricky because the MIDI is like its own stream of information and it doesn't really obey the the clock necessarily um and uh what you'll end up having is due to how much latency you have set up for your sound card you'll have a little bit of an audio delay when you send that midi information to um whatever external hardware you have so i have this kind of demoed here with the sh01a and i can demo it with the just the beats here and see that make sure I don't have this one running okay cool it's not quite on beat and if you actually record it wait where is the recording (laughs) oh I see yeah if you If you actually record that. I mean, that delay can be an effect all on its own. Um, If, if, you know, you want to uh, kind of get that and I've actually used that to my advantage. I could imagine Um, it's like the way I know jazz players, sometimes they're sitting ahead of the beat or behind the beat, depending upon how they want it to feel. Yeah. But you can see right here, like it's not quite lining up with the grid. Yeah. Uh, when you're sending the MIDI out, so there's there's two ways you can do that. Uh, to you can fix it, um, like with the pattern mutator, I ended up. Uh, you can bounce the the pattern to MIDI with this uh, send to track function here. Yeah. Which we'll can review a little bit later, and with that, um, I ended up uh, putting this on a groove so hang on <laughs> so do a couple things here bypass this so i'm not playing that oh right yeah and um unmute this and so i i put this on a groove um a regroove and i've slid uh the midi notes back oh, just interesting wait i'm going to zoom in on your on your screen so people can see this so you you're using the slide. This is a knob that I have never used in the Groove Mixer. Um, in fact, if you had told me to draw a picture of the Groove Mixer channel, I probably wouldn't have even driven, drawn the knob because I it just my eyes went past it. So you're, but you're actually using the Groove Mixer 
to not necessarily change the timing of the notes on an individual. It's not like using it for MPC swing or anything like that. You're just literally using it as a global slide function to pull back the notes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I didn't realize it was so, there. And now it's making me realize <laughs> there's times where that would be super useful in like trap drum programming and stuff where you want to get your snare and your clap to kind of sit off from each other. You're blowing yeah. my mind, B, and I didn't know that was there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go play with that now. But yeah, and, I mean, this thing is, yeah, I, I, I recently learned about this when I was trying to debug the MIDI issue because usually I'm doing the onboard sequencer. But yeah. So I can demo it really quick. Yeah, cool. Uh, hopefully this won't get triggered by the pattern mutator, but we'll see. There we go. Now, are you, <laughs> are, when, you um, when you do that, are you just going by ear? In terms of where you're setting that slide button, are you doing that by ear to slide it backwards or are you sort of recording and watching it? Cause if you were to change that slide value while recording, you would just see the pattern moving against the, right. the bar line. Right? Um, it depends. Like if I want to be really surgical about it, um, I'll look at the, you know, the waveform that's coming out and kind of zoom in and like go, eh, okay, it's close enough or something. Um, Cause there is, there is a slight, wobble with with any kind of gear anyway that you right. get but it, it'll average to right about where you want it um and uh yeah but if i want it to have a feeling and i really want to go by the feeling then i'll do it by ear and just kind of get Smart. it exactly to where i want and and if i were doing that i would actually map this out to a knob um and kind of control it with a knob. Oh, interesting. I, you know, with the mouse, it's like, you kind of, you know, you have one <laughs> finger spasm and then it's, um, <laughs> right. you know, but with this, this is a lot more ergonomic for the fingers. Uh, if you map it out to a That knob, makes sense. So. And that's a great, you know, I mean, just in terms of like advice that people can take away from this, that's, it's always worth saying. I, I talk about it all the time that this is one of those examples of like, don't, don't make music with your eyes, make music with your ears. And if it sounds right, it is right, regardless of how it lines up visually on the screen. It's like, if it feels right, then yeah. it's right. So doing it that way makes exactly. total sense. Because if you have it so rigid, sometimes it's just like, okay, well, maybe this isn't really that interesting. But I wanted to have it kind of rigid just so I could show you the, the demo of it being very much off. And right, right, off. right. So. But so should we now, I saw you have a pattern mutator up there and maybe we should talk about what you're doing with pattern mutator um i guess even on that um on that synth. yeah that. so um i'm going to completely disregard this whole midi thing because i want to actually mutate patterns live um and i realized in order to do that uh i needed to kind of work around the delay in a different way so i added this device here um which is the the VMG01, I think if I go to this, you can find it. It's by Norman Hansen, the VMG01 sample delay. Um, and so you kind of have to think of it as this delaying your pattern to the next, so that the second 16th note is now the first note. Oh, on, okay. But then, so you have to adjust your pattern accordingly and kind of shifted around right because you can't slide backwards in time in real time you have to right you yeah. can't yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that makes so, sense um, and for people that are um uh watching and aren't familiar with that rack extension the sample by sample delay you might someone might hear that and go oh okay it's like it's sampling and and delaying and it's like no it's it's actually delaying by such a minute increment it's it's we're talking like samples as in you know digital audio has forty four thousand samples per second um uh, 44.1 but you know what i mean um yeah and and so it's de it's l allowing you to delay things by those individual digital sample increments um yeah. quite so a the, handy little number, yeah it, it this number will change of course depending on your sound card and how much buffer you have in place right, so right. you'll you, you know don't just copy this this number and have it be <laughs> that's right like you have to kind of use your ear or you can monitor it. You can, you can 
always make this into a record source and monitor it on a separate track um, and adjust it by, you know, sight if you want to be super surgical about it, um, or you can use your ears. Um, but let's see, let's get, let's see the pattern mutator in action here. So if I... Already, I'm hearing some dope patterns. From I know. <laughs> this, it's so it is so fun to hear you do this because I, I you know, I, I I made the video for uh, Pattern Mutator and I, I did part of the music for that video as well. And I, I played around with it just the way I play around with all Reason devices while they're in development and when they come out. But I don't make cool bass patterns like that. And it's like instant. It's like it's it. Pattern Mutator is home. You've brought it home to where it was always meant to be, Beyun. It sounds so cool when you do that. That's great. Um. What now? In terms of your um working with it like that, I mean, you 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 were getting good patterns. Just every click of the button really was like something that was like that's that's a viable pattern. Um. Would you often um, what would be the sort of workflow you do? You just do that and you periodically go, oh, that's a cool one. And you'd store that to a memory slot and then keep going and go, oh, that's a cool one and store that to a memory slot. Is that? Yeah, that's kind of like how I, I operated. So this pattern right here actually came from this starting pattern, which I'll play. And so, I mean, you know, you, you, you kind of have to start with a good sounding something to begin with, like at least have kind of the the no, so the notes you want in place. Okay, right. Um, but uh, it doesn't have to be. I mean, this obviously it has, you know, it's not not really a great rhythm to it. I mean, you can adjust the gate length of it. But um, I basically I can just see if we can replicate something interesting. I just added uh, the notes in using the step record. For this mm -hmm. um, and just kind of went let's see mm. let me get mm. all right <laughs> let me make sure it's funny that check, the noise you just I... made when you were that mm, i thought that was the, the synth patch you had on i was like that's an interesting <laughs> sonic choice <laughs> well let me make sure that um my here. okay here we go we're we're in the right place okay step record um Okay, so now we're at 16 notes. Okay. So it's just this really simple three note pattern. I, the most, the, the best bass lines are going to be like just a handful of notes. It's okay. not going to be anything complicated. And then I'll just uh, stop that and run. <laughs> <laughs> that does sound um nice. and so i just kind of you know once i have that pattern ready um i'll get it maybe lined up so now so what i'm doing here is just kind of adjusting the wheel back a little bit So kind of good. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I, I just want to just, I'm going to mute my mic and I'm, I'm ready for like you just to do a set now. Um, 
Matthias, uh, who was uh, a part of the, you know, uh, he was he's the reason product manager. He's part of the, the team that designed and and made this. Um, he says it's so fun that you're using it with a one on one because when he designed this and or when they designed it, ninety um, percent of my testing and design input was based on using it with a one on one. So oh wow, <laughs> there you go. You've 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 done the perfect pairing of peanut butter and chocolate all over again. Um, but what what really strikes me about that watching you do that um, is that. Um, how do I explain this? So, uh, I think it was pattern four. Was that pattern the one that you just stepped in manually? Is it still there in pattern four? Yeah. That is not on its own, no offense to your, your note choices, but it's not on its own a super cool pattern. It doesn't like, if I'm thinking about myself, if I had made it that far, that's where my own inner critic would come in and go, no, you suck. This isn't the, sounds nothing like the records you like. It's terrible, you know, um, but that's like, it's only step one. And, and you sort of had the faith to go past that to actually get into the, co- like the cooler mutated version of the pattern. Um, uh, I wonder if you could just play pat- pattern four again for a second. Sure. This is where we started. Whoop. Like it's not terrible. It's just not setting the world on fire. It's like, you know. Having that space in between notes uh, really creates a storyline. Yeah. It's just all the same length and the same, also the same velocity. It's not very interesting at all. Um, and I mean, there's a few few things I didn't bump up, like the density of the notes. Um, so I want to increase the, or I guess decrease it decreases, the density. Yeah, my, ran, randomize the density a little bit. I so think there's... my understanding, and, and Matthias, since you're you're in the audience, you can let us know in the comments. My understanding is the density will reduce as you go up. Like if you were to max out the density knob, you'd actually pull out a ton of notes. It's like the higher you go, the more the less dense it's getting. It's an inverse kind of relationship. Yeah, um, that's kind of what I was getting from it. Um, actually, I don't want to necessarily swap. Is just kind of Swapping the individual notes is what I... Yeah. It's like a little nice electro sequence. Yeah. Yeah, I think I want... uh, Let me see. Maybe it'll go with this pattern. the drums really make quite a difference as well in terms of you know if you listen to that on its own obviously your brain can follow the pattern but that drum just puts you right into the the sort of that i don't want to it's not trance but the the, sort of the trance state that this music can kind of put you in where you can just go hours listening to these patterns and and they never get tiring um yeah matthias it's important to have that to have the beat going yeah with, with the pattern it kind of grounds you right Matthias posted a comment. He said, density basically flips the state of notes. Matthias, that means nothing to me. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, oh, wait, he, say, he said some more. He says, uh, if there was a note, it's removed. If there was silence, it adds a note. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Ah, that's... So if you had very few notes in the starting pattern, you might get more notes. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. That is, that's, uh-huh, <laughs> Stefan <laughs> Kwame said, ah, the old switcheroo. <laughs> yeah, it's the old switcheroo. That's right. Okay, cool. Thank you. That actually does make sense, Matthias. Sorry to, um, sorry to poo-poo your, uh, your first answer. That's cool. Yeah, so, but yeah, but the, the drums make such a difference. And then uh, the other thing I, I found interesting just in watching you do this is that you, you made, there was a creative choice you're making kind of on the fly there where something about the pattern as it was mutated, I don't know if it was that it started using higher pitches or something, but it made you want a different drum beat. I wonder if you you could enlighten us as to what 
made your brain go, wait a second, let me switch this up. I mean, it's that, that practice of listening, right? That it, there's my, I've already programmed in my brain from listening to all of these tracks that, ah, that has a feel of what this should be. This is more of kind of more of what an electro track would be like and not really so much a 404 techno track. And I kind of shifted over to that because um, it reminded me of, of some electro tracks that I, I had stored in there. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. So, that's, that's cool. Um, I, I, I think it's the, yeah, it's definitely the higher pitches probably going in between because um, with, with techno, it's really, you have less of that um, kind of melodic pull uh, between the highs and lows. Um, it's really more like you're kind of staying maybe in between two octaves and it's very much more uh, rigid and I guess hypnotic in a sense, in a different way that this is hypnotic. It's hard to explain. I'm really bad at using words. For <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, I'm following you just fine. No, that makes total sense. That makes total sense. Um, let's see here. I'm just checking in with the, uh, you know what? We should have just put this up on the screen. So, um, George is asking what drum machine is she using? Um, that that's the electron box that you're using there. Yeah. It's the electron rhythm. Um, but I'm using samples for this. I'm used for, for this particular drum beat. Uh, this is a kind of modified 808 kit. Oh, okay. That's, yeah. It, it does electro, sound, sound 808, 808. You need the, you know, and then for the techno, so this is, and then, um, that was for, a beastie boys track. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, for the techno beat, I was using a, a 909, some 909 samples. Um, and of course I could use this, uh, and I, I love using this if I'm really, like, if it's a really 909 focused kind of track and it's a beat track. Um, the one thing I don't really like about it, uh, for like, in studio work um, is it's hard to kind of split the audio out a little bit. This, I, I have a lot of like ports in the back. I can split the audio out into different um, uh, different inputs on my sound card and have them on different channels in reason. Gotcha. It's a little easier to work with. Gotcha. Um, so now- I think there's a way to do it with USB, but I haven't gotten around to it, so. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You got a solution yeah. that's working. <laughs> Um, that, that, uh, TR09, uh, does that also run off battery, uh, in the same way? And would you ever, I don't know, is it, is a, yes, really? You'd yeah, hang I know, out on the I beach? Know, uh, yes. And I have, and I have, if you go to my, <laughs> um, Instagram, you can see some, uh, videos from the past of me actually. So the nice thing about these Roland instruments, and this is why I love this thing, um, is it's great for sketching because, uh, you can there's a little mix in port on there. So you can feed the output, say, of uh, the, eight, the 09, or I also have a TR08. You can feed the output of that into the mix in port of the 303 oh. and listen to it on your headphones. And so you're listening to both of these things and it's just kind of, you know, you have your own little jam session. And you can, you know, theoretically put a number of, like, you can hook it up to the SHO-1A and- I'm so, kind of I am so uh, like ingrained in the Reason Studios world that the first thing my brain, I go like, oh, it's like Rebirth. It's like, wait, no, no, Rebirth <laughs> is like those things. <laughs> but yeah, to be able to pair them together like that, that's great. Um, so now I'm I'm seeing, I'm, I'm starting to peep off to the right side of some stuff in this file that you've got here. You've got other pattern mutators there. I'm curious what else is maybe- yeah, oh, man, oh, you got a whole so, bunch. Of, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is where I was kind of uh, having fun a bit with um, with the three hundred three because originally I was like, oh, I'm going to program the SHL one A and like um, uh, a CZV uh, VST that I have here, um, but I, I won't really program the three hundred three because like I love the sequencer on board. Here. Yeah. But I was like, well, okay, but why not? You know, why not have a go at it? <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> and and, uh, and I did, and I actually, I kind of, I like, I like what, what what started to happen with it because it was really coming up with some interesting things. So 
Of course, the 303, you know, you, you can affect the mood of a track instantly just based on what kind of effects you put on it, just like you would with a guitar, so... So I just switched to different channels. I have a different effects plus on it. So now it sounds like some kind of super ravey. So that that distortion and, and that we're hearing, and it's a delay, I think, too, that's happened. Those are things inside devices in Reason that are supplying yes. those? Yeah, so I have these combinators here. Oh. Um, I mean, I could just dump it all in here, but the nice thing about combinators is you can save a patch. Right. Uh, and just kind of choose it when you open a new project yep. and kind of have your sound instantly. instantly and then I've just routed it in the back uh, through, you know, the other effects. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. The delay and then into here. That uh, um, that Kuasa effector distortion uh, is a really it it. I'm not surprised to see that that's what you're using to get that sound because it really does that sound very well. Yeah, so that's actually the earlier sound. Let's see this 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 crazy sound here. Oh. Well, let me let me play the actual pattern mutator. That's the onboard uh, pattern. This one. That's this. Oh, okay. So I've got a couple more things in it. I've got this, uh, yeah. You run it through the amp, oh, yeah. is it the cream amp? Yeah. Yep, the cream amp. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, and then some, some echo. So. Running, um, the, the idea of running a, a 303 through an amp simulator is kind of a, just, it's an interesting idea to me. I don't think I've tried that in that Europe, you know, it would be literally like plugging a, a 303 into a, a Marshall amp, you know, which is not obviously the traditional thing, but you end up with this, the sound of the, you know, the speaker, the the cabinet, all that stuff, which isn't. Yeah. Part. And you hear kind of some noise in the background, which is interesting. Right. Um, I mean, th you have to think about why was the 303 created? It was created to emulate a bass guitar, right? Right. So you can treat your 303 just like you would treat your guitar. Oh, that's and really... I that... actually, you know, I have some pedals back here, which are great if you want to do stuff more live. Yeah. And, you know, just like you would bu build a, a, a pedal board for your guitar, you are effectively doing the same thing with your 303. It's, the, a, it's the, the same kind that's of... That's such a full circle thing, though, because, I mean, I, as I know the story of the 303, it was like... Roland made this device and they were like, hey, it can be your bass player and your little bossa nova lounge band. And it was roundly rejected as like the worst <laughs> attempt at a, as a bass simulator. And then it was, you know, people like Pierre and, and certainly Pierre um, who sort of rediscovered its potential as this totally other thing. But I sort of love that you're then coming at it from you're coming back around the other end where you're like, right, but now let's treat it like a bass. <laughs> it's not a bass, but we can still if that's what it was intended as, we can still think of it as a base and put effects and, and run it through an amp and all this stuff. That's really cool. Really, really cool. There was a, let me scroll up. I missed it here. Oh, there was some discussion. People noticed the um, uh, saturation knob VST that you're running uh, in one of those combinators. And then they were discussing it's a, a rack extension as well, which is true. And I think it's free as a rack extension. I don't know if the, v, I imagine the VST is probably free too. Um, I had the I had the VST back from when I was running uh, in Ableton, um, so I just kind of stuck it in there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a super super handy. I mean, in either form, the the uh, the DSP of it. It's a really handy little uh, effect to be able to put on things. Matthias, meanwhile, is very happy because uh, we've now covered the three hundred three. He says that was we've now covered one hundred percent of his test cases while designing Pattern Mutator. <laughs> so you've made him very happy. <laughs> um but cool that yeah I, and i i do love that you um that you did sort of reapproach the idea of using the 303 even though you love programming the 303 for its quirks and the way you've become comfortable with it you know pattern mutator would be a certain way where you could it it's like I mean, Pattern Mutator, in a sense, is a happy accident machine. It takes something that you, even your best laid plans of what pattern you might have wanted, and then it it 
mucks with it in a way that's unexpected. So why not apply that to the 303 and put some of that serendipity back into the equation? Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we can, we can test it out a little bit more and see if we can do it. So this, so this is where I started. And then this is one of the patterns. So let's see. all day i mean yeah I, I think i can listen to it all day that is so cool and again again like um I, I, the one of these takeaways that i sort of am seeing is that your starting pattern is a fairly just it's a non-stop fairly vanilla sequence of notes you know it's not like the the pattern as it becomes is something that's got different gate lengths and 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 it's got space and all that stuff but could you play the that starting pattern again that you had sure Go all the way here. Wait, hang on. Go back here. Yeah. I mean, that's great. what like what I think is great about that is that a lot of times when when those of us who are wanting to get into experimenting with a style of music, all we have to reference is the end point. We can listen to the records as they were finished and mixed and perfect with the pattern exactly as you want it. But it's it's more rare to get to hear the the sausage being made, you know, the the process as it's happening. And I think the takeaway there for anyone that wants to experiment with this kind of stuff and may, may just for the fun of it today, you know, play around with doing sort of uh, patterns like this, is that the starting pattern you don't you don't need to make the world's you don't need to win the Grammy for best starting pattern, you know, <laughs> in order to do this. You just need to get a sequence of notes in there. You've got it's like you said, it's fairly simple number of pitches. There's a lot of repetition, a lot of you know, da 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 and and from that then you get into actually adjusting the pattern and playing around with it, you know. Very cool. Um I'm looking in here. Got another thing. Oh, yeah, do you? Let's play, play with the CZV. So this is uh, one of Arturia's uh, little VSTs. Right. I love the I love their whole suite. Um, and I was just kind of playing with uh, hooking up the dual arpeggio. Oh, cool. Uh, to it and using that as kind of the starting pattern because with electro patterns. It kind of starts a little bit. So if I bypass this all, well, actually, if I, uh, let's see, let me go over here. <laughs> um, where am I? I'm just turning the, this pattern mutator off um, for the time being. And if I just start with the ARP, make sure my keyboard is in the right place. This one. Okay. So if I, this of course doesn't make sense without a beat. <laughs> so. bit 
bit of a generic kind of electro thing going on. Um, yeah. Zoom is uh, putting these controls not in a great location. Oh, Zoom. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's why I, I have, luckily I have this controller that can adjust it. So I'm going to make this kind of like a four, uh, four bar. Okay. Uh, a four pattern. bar pattern. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And so, I mean, I'll just show you, I guess. But so you're, what, are you going to sort of live record into it effectively? Is that the idea? Yeah, that's the idea. Cool. So I'm going to start with a, let me put this again, zoom. Okay. <laughs> um, Daryl Huggins says beasties. He's not the only one singing brass monkey. When I hear just that drum beat on its own, that's what what happens anyway sorry go on um so i'm gonna make this okay and then and record it in but nah um <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was cool <laughs> it wasn't really going in the direction i wanted it to go <laughs> um but i had come up with a cool pattern last night let's see if i can get that one playing so Yeah. Guess, uh, you know, I guess the, the other one was kind of working. Yeah, I, 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 I you thought you were onto something. Wait, let me, let me get this started on the first. to have the pads in there that's why i have that <laughs> it's great <laughs> it's totally um, great we're gonna we're gonna just now we're gonna set you going and just watch you for the next hour and a half while you go through this <laughs> experimental uh live set but that's really cool that is really cool and it there's a comment someone set up above and then it's now too far to scroll to find it again uh but they were starting to notice uh with pattern mutator that they said something like it seems like pattern mutator does its best stuff when you give it a lot to work with. And it looks like you've done that in two different ways. One, the first way was by giving it a lot of just 16 notes in a bar at full gate length. And then this way is by giving it, you're not just giving it nonstop notes, but you're giving it four bars worth of pattern to play with both, mm -hmm. both variants of giving it a lot of material to work with. So very, yeah. Very, and, very and cool. Thank you. And one thing that I wanted to kind of mention, um, I like using the combinator uh, to kind of discover hidden controls yeah. uh, for certain things. Because um, some, sometimes you can access uh, things programmatically that you don't really have access to in this interface. Um, and one thing I discovered was like the the muted or the mutation gate. So you 
on the mutate, mutated pattern, you can, you can change the gate length versus just doing it on the starting pattern. Um, oh, wait a so second. I, I thought... You're, you're blowing my mind here. You're saying, so if, if you're in regular pattern mode, not mutation mode, that gate length will adjust the note length. But yeah, you're saying that yeah. via the combinator, you can do that same thing to the mutated. Yes. Yeah. Oh. And there's a couple, couple other things. I actually was looking for uh, being able to programmatically press the mutate button and oh, have okay. kind of like this weird, like, you know, maybe add like an LFO to it that would every, uh, you know, four bars or something uh, mutated yeah. slightly, yeah. depending on what kind of print. And, but unfortunately, I couldn't confine Is it not there? there? Is there, is there yeah. now I'm, I'm, I may, uh, we may prove it wrong twice, but on the backside, is there any CV related uh, opportunity? Uh, I was, I was looking for that, but I oh, couldn't, no. couldn't find it. But Matthias. That, that would be, that would be something <laughs> Maybe in version two. Yeah, version two, <laughs> Matthias, get get on that. Um, because yeah, I know I know you mean it'd be kind of cool just to kind of mutate on the fly like that, uh, via hardware for, you know, the way that you'd probably have it hooked up. Um, but that is your what you've you've hit upon there is a fantastic tip for people that are exploring when you're exploring a new device. There's kind of like exploring what's in front of you on the device, and then. If you feel that you've kind of wrung out every option that you've explored on that, and you want to kind of dig deeper into a device, put it in a combinator and go in and see. Because like you said, there's a lot of times, it's very often that there's far more options that are automatable or assignable to knobs and buttons in the combinator than than what you might be able to just right click and, and get to or option click and do sort of things that way directly on the device. So... Mm -hmm. And and you'll see things like you, in when you saw that in the menu, the mutate gate length, it will give you musical ideas just by seeing it as an option. You go, oh, I know what I could do with that, and then you're off to the races, you know. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, Chalism says every device and reason should have tons of CV on the back. This is reason. Chalism, I think uh, in spirit, uh, everyone, we all agree with you. Um, I. Not yeah, do look at dual arpeggio is lonely there with no C V on the back. Oh, dual arpeggio. <laughs> but no, I have actually I mean I've been happy to see that some of the, the later players have been getting uh, some C V stuff. Do you uh, because you are so hardware based, do you mess around with the C V stuff often or is that Oh uh, yeah, with a nice modular unit. Um I don't have a modular unit, but I will at some point get one. My it's condolences to your time. bank account. Yes. <laughs> um, I kind of want to get the ones that you build yourself. I think I can, I think I can do the little, little small modular projects, but right. I don't know. We'll see. Um, yeah. When I get to that point, uh, I will definitely be messing around with this, but I do have some software uh, modular type things, which I have yet to kind of really dive into because I've just been focusing on this see the problem with software is you get a lot of you can get a lot of stuff but then it's like ah yeah <laughs> you know? yeah where where do i start so you just kind of have to once you master something then move on to the next thing um and that's just one thing that hasn't quite made it to the top of my my to-do list yet right it will it well will. it's uh you've got you've kind of gotten yourself a nice little hybrid of hardware and um, hardware and software and, and kind of you're, you're, you're working in a, you know, a program like reason, you're sort of working with these environments that have limited track, unlimited track counts and unlimited device counts and an unlimited, you know, anything you want to throw at it, but you've kind of put, you know, your, your core, your limited set in to actually kind of keep you working within the confines of a sort of creative formula, um, in a good way, not, you know, formulas have get a bad rap but in this sense it's like there's a reason why rock bands have a guitar a bass maybe a keyboard a drummer or something you know it's like there's a lot of great music that gets made with that and you don't always have to decide that you're gonna have fifty thousand didgeridoos in your uh, rock band you know <laughs> yeah so i mean sometimes the best ideas are the simple ones so uh right yeah. Right. Often they are actually not just sometimes. Often. I know frustratingly because that then you get into uh, 
overthinking things and you're going, God, I should, wait, hang on, what's the simple thing? I, I, sh- I shouldn't overthink this, you know? Yeah. Well, listen, Beun, I am, um, I'm so thrilled that you uh, could give us this time today and show us this stuff because uh, even as someone myself who's played around with Pattern Mutator and, and I've been making, you know, I'm not a, I don't work within these sort of pattern-based genres much, but I've been for the last few weeks playing around with them a lot because of Pattern Mutator. And it is so inspiring to see someone who does it well um, and just gives me all sorts of ideas. So my afternoon, uh, once our live stream is done, is going to be partially based around going, all right, well, how did, how did be do this? Wait a second. I got to gotta go at this again and try to try and make myself sound even a fraction as cool as it sounds when you do it. Cause it, it sounds so good when you do it. Um, guys in the chat, throw out any last questions if you have them. Um, and we're going to, we're going to let be get on with her day and, and the, all of us get on with our day, I guess too. But, um, I wanted to ask you while they're thrown, if they have any last questions to throw in at us, um, I wanted to ask you, how can people who are um, hearing you and wanting to hear more of your stuff, where should they go? What, what's, what are the social channels? I know you've got a label. Maybe we should let people know about that as well. Um, yeah. So um, I run a label called Vault Wax. Um, and uh, so Vault is in it, like a vault. Like pole uh, vault? V-A-U-L-T, Wax, W-A-X. Um, so you can find that at vaultwax.com. Uh, and that should have a link to our band camp and we have three releases on it, um, already this year, um, and they're vinyl and digital. Um, and there's some vinyl available on Bandcamp as well as clone, uh, just through clone distribution. So you can find it on Juno or pretty much anywhere. Um, and, uh, then my socials are Beyun 303, B-E-Y-U-N 303, um, on all the socials, so Instagram. Stefan uh, just very uh, yeah. well timed posted that in the chat, so I put that up on screen for people too. So, be on three oh three. Yay! <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's. Uh, oh yeah, and uh, Vault Wax has a YouTube channel. I've been experimenting um, with a lot of interesting uh, analog video type things. I have this little. Actually, I do have a modular thing. One second. Oh, just got very exciting. Plus, now that now that you've this is, this is the only kind of modular like device I have, and it's a LZX video. So I've been experimenting with um, analog video going through that, and you can see the results of that on Vault Wax. Oh, cool, cool. Now, when you I have to ask because when you move that, you have a sign down there below your keyboard that says "Dance something something something," and I'm now I'm curious, what does that say? Oh, it says um, dance language of the soul. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. Yeah, my my parents made that for me. Did they? Really yeah. Well, that's sweet. <laughs> um, that uh, I guess that um, means that your your parents are uh, uh, supportive of your. Yeah, of it, your it took them a while to kind of understand, mm. but um, actually, when I had the vault nights going, all it took was inviting them to so vault was the name of the party that i had in, in boston. boston okay and now it's vault wax um so uh i invited them to come to the nights and they went not really knowing what to expect and they actually really enjoyed it and Interesting. while they were in town and not like traveling because of the winter weather in boston being bad were they um, like taking ecstasy what did you was your did your mom have a pacifier or something that you have to be like mom what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> no no um they were just like dan- they would come at the beginning of the night and like dance all the way up till they you know i mean they they sometimes would leave early after i'd open and go home because they're too tired but um they would stay and actually got to know a lot of uh my friends in the scene oh cool well. cool i will yeah. say you know if this is true of all electronic genres that seeing electronic music in a club in the environment where they were you know meant for is an entirely different experience than if you were just like i should see what this uh i should see what this dubstep's about let me pull it up on my phone and listen over my small mono speaker and just sample some of this music like it's it has nothing to do with the actual experience of being in a club and hearing it so it's i'm sure it must have been eye opening for them there's a question yeah. that came in from eric eric zwag he says, is acid often mixed with other styles nowadays? And I think you sort of hinted at 
that there is certain kind of modern fusions going on nowadays? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, traditional acid house uh, really has more of a jacking uh, four, four beat to it. Um, you know, you, you, it, it's either 808 or 909 or 707 drum kit. And you, when you hear it, it's like, yeah, it kind of makes you want to jack your body in a certain way. Um, and, uh, but like acid techno, for instance, uh, will typically have shorter patterns. So like um, only eight note pattern that's repeating. Um, typically, you know, I don't want to be like, it must have this, um, but if you want a techno feel, there's, you know, you'd go for that. Um, and then at the acid sound is often, you know, the 303 is often used in electro tracks. Mm. Um, so you'll have more of the bro broken beat type uh, stuff or not break beat. It's not really break beat because then you have break beat style tracks, which are actually cutting up break beats like you would with a jungle uh, record or with drum and bass except you're doing it at kind of a lower BPM. So typically, you know, like 140 and below, which is considered slow for break beat type tracks. Okay. And you, you could, there's a lot of uh, music coming out these days with, with a lot of break beat inspired uh, ravey style tracks, which is actually, it's new, but it's also old because if you look at the history, it's like, you know, you, you had that coming up kind of in the mid nineties a little bit. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everything is so, is so related. Um, you know, acid is also very much, uh, kind of the beginnings of trance. So as things got a little faster and faster, you had kind of that acid trance style stuff. Right. And, um, you know, it's a very psychedelic sound. Like you hear it and you're like, you just want to trip out. So it's like, mm. <laughs> it <kinda laughs> right. makes sense. Uh, but, but it is, that uh, is interesting. I mean, we so often talk about genres as these like sort of pigeonholed little siloed things but it really is a continuum i mean house came out of disco acid ha came out of you know traditional house and then yeah trance came out of acid it's like it is it's a it's a total continuum of that that is the tapestry of music i guess you know yeah. um there was another question um reason east has asked uh it's too far to put up on screen they asked uh if you have your tracks mastered which i imagine especially if you're pressing wax and doing vinyl yes. that you definitely do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Most definitely. I, I want to, um, if I, I guess for people uh, watching in the consideration for vinyl, am I, I'm correct in saying this. If you, if it's not mastered correctly, the, the base can actually, the needle can jump if you aren't handling yeah. the low end. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. You have to be really careful with the low end and actually have my friend um, less noise do it. Um, he used to, uh, he was a member of Future um, not too long ago. Oh, cool. Um, and uh, he did a lot of the the mastering for Pierre's labels. And he also does a lot of the, mas he does all the mastering for Vault Wax at the moment. And um, he is really precise about that low end and making sure it sits just in the right place so it's not too wide. Because if it's too wide and it, yeah, that needle will jump and the whole record is basically ruined in a way um and it you know it's hard to play say you have a a track where the groove is just so close like the the etches in the groove are just so close to the next uh groove that goes around you know you can't play that track in a setting like in the club uh where you might have a lot of vibrations happening because if it's so oh. fragile that it'll just skip then you know, so even even that kind of like if it'll play fine in the studio, but then th is not sitting in well enough. Wow. To, to really, yeah. So it's a whole I bet it's a whole other thing with vinyl. <laughs> you have to put your turntables on isolators. Uh, isolation. I remember when I box. I've only pressed vinyl on a, a release that I did once. And I remember at the time saying that that was the most fun thing that I'll never do again because it was such a, I mean, it's so complicated compared to like normal, you know, the normal process, especially in digital now. It's like, you know, I can mix something, I can master it inside Reason, export it, put it up online and it's done, you know. But with the vinyl stuff, you know, you get into the like the, the plates, you know, and the metal plate stuff that you get, you know, and then test pressings and, and the whole thing. It mm -hmm. was a... Uh, 
it was it was illuminating. It was a really interesting process to go through. And if anyone uh, who does make music and hasn't pressed vinyl, I invite you to do it. You obviously do a lot of it, so it's maybe not you've you've gotten some of those kinks worked out. But the first time I did it, I was yeah. like, Jesus, this is a compl complex process. Yeah, it helps to have a good mastering engineer and a good pressing plant. So right, right, <laughs> you gotta have you have trust in them too. Cause if you've got a thousand copies yeah. of a vinyl and it, you get out to the clubs and it's like, Oh, it's yeah. It can't play it in a club. It doesn't work. Um, yeah. wow. Well, cool. Well, listen, being, I, uh, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let everybody here go. Uh, I'm going to go start making some patterns myself. I'm going to start messing around with this, but, um, right. thanks so much for, uh, taking the time to, uh, hang out with us here and show us sort of, a little bit of, of your world in the hardware thing, but certainly how you're integrating it as well. I think it's really neat uh, and kind of inspiring for anyone that uh, wants to maybe start playing around with some hardware. This is a great way to kind of stay inside the reason environment that you enjoy, but then dabble into the, the 3D world a little bit. It's yeah, very cool. Thank now, you. I wonder, thanks for having me. This is a lot of fun. Of course, of course. I mean, we'd, we'd love to have you back too when we're we're when we start doing streams again in the new year, we're going to take a little break. If anyone doesn't know, uh, we've got a stream next week and then we're going to take a little break for the holidays and, and the new year and stuff. And we're going to come back later and do more, but um, in the new year, we should, we should definitely have you back because it's fun. Uh, I wonder if I could put in a request here as we go out. Um, it's, it's almost becoming something of a tradition that I, I have the guest play us our outro music via whatever we've been working on. So I wonder if you could get any, any one of these sort of things going with the drums and the, um, and a pattern. And, uh, as I say, my, my goodbyes to everybody here and wrap up the stream, you will be our outro music. All right. I guess I'll just play what I had it on. Yeah. So. And if you have, um, the ability, can you, is it hooked up to the master fader where you can kick it down about, uh, yeah. 12 dB or so? Perfect. Oh, you can go up a little bit. Yeah, perfect. Perfect, perfect. All right. I'll be back with you once we're off air uh, to uh, say my own goodbyes to you. But, Bayoun, thank you so much for having uh, for being our guest today. And, guys, you heard me say it. We've got one more. I, it's like, do we call it season one of the Reason live stream? I don't know. I don't know if that's what we call it. But we've got one more episode next week before we go on our little holiday hiatus and that's going to be jeff gibbons and if you haven't seen jeff gibbons youtube channel it's awesome and jeff's a super nice guy super fun to talk to so you're going to want to tune in for that next week jeff has a particular expertise both in reason but also in um machine and he he is using the reason rack plugin inside machine and he's going to be showing you some tips related to that and uh, just we'll be talking to Jeff and hanging out and kind of getting to know uh, his musical background as well. So tune in for that. And until then, make some music. Get, you hear this? Let's make some patterns. I think, I think the, the, the flavor of the week is patterns. And if you do anything cool, pattern-based, with Pattern Mutator or just, you know, anything, any fun pattern-based music that you make this week, send it to us. Like, tweet it at us or Instagram or whatever. Get it get it in front of us because we love hearing what you guys do after these live streams and sort of the music that some of these hangouts together inspires from you so send us your stuff and uh who knows stefan will retweet you or regram you or i don't i don't that's not my world i don't know i don't know how to do the snap talks but um i'll see you guys next week on the reason live stream with jeff gibbons and until then let's just vibe out to this while we while it goes see you guys have a good week